Games. Games have been a part of people's lives for as long as humans have existed. Their origins can be traced all the way back to prehistoric times when gaming tools were made of bones and sticks. These simple instruments of play have evolved over time into a cherished form of entertainment that no society can thrive without. From the very first emergence of board games in pre-dynastic Egypt, circa 3500 BC, to modern sporting events like baseball, games have played a major role in developing and maintaining civilization. Throughout history, there has not been one single instance of a society that has not developed some sort of pastime activity to provide entertainment and engage in cooperative and competitive play. This goes to show how important games are to us on both a personal and global level. And as technology advances, so do the games we play. And boy, have they advanced. Sticks and stones have evolved into touch screens and gaming consoles, and the way games affect us has changed radically. Let's take a look at one of today's most lucrative industries, video games, and find out how and why they influence our lives. Let's discover why it's good to game. In the early 1950s, academic researchers developed interactive simulations with early computer software through which to test scientific theories. Little did they know that their educational efforts would eventually lead to a technological breakthrough that would cause kids to count the seconds until school was over. The arcade phenomenon that swept through the United States from the 1970s to the mid-1980s was the after-school pastime that made sitting through classes worth it. Kids could finally break out of their mundane routines and imagine they were a space pilot, saving Earth from evil invaders. They could challenge friends to beat their high scores and engage in a form of entertainment that stimulated their minds and sharpened their senses, like no other medium had before. And it wasn't just kids either. While the majority of arcade gamers were middle school to high school aged, even adults saw merit in arcade games as an enjoyable pastime. The arcade even made it into the living room with the invention of the home console. The very first home console playable from a TV set was Magnavox's Odyssey. A man named Ralph Bayer designed the console in 1972 as a virtual means to play simple simulations of sports games, but it eventually became no more than a means through which to play Atari's widely popular arcade game Pong in the comfort of a gamer's own home. The moderate success of home consoles led to more and more variations from different companies such as the Fairchild Video Entertainment System, the Atari 2600, and various cartridge-based handheld consoles like Milton Bradley's Microvision and Nintendo's Game & Watch. It wasn't all good times for gaming though. Manufacturers selling systems at a loss in order to clear stock caused problems for the market and both home consoles and arcade games crashed, causing many game companies to go out of business. This was proof enough to many that video gaming was no more than a fad. In 1983, there were so many different consoles and highly marketed low-quality games out there that gamers grew tired of playing them and lost faith in the industry. By 1984, all North American game consoles were discontinued. The future was bleak for video games. But one Japanese company still had hope for the medium. Nintendo released their Famicom console in the United States under the name NES, the Nintendo Entertainment System. And just like that, games were back. The NES sold more units in North America than any console in history, and its main mascot, Mario, became the face of video gaming, and remains so even to this day. The release of the NES single-handedly revitalized the industry, and inspired the resurgence of home gaming that thrives today. The success of the NES led to a whole series of consoles from Nintendo, and by the time of the release of the Nintendo 64 in 1996, major competitors Sega and Sony had released their own consoles to combat Nintendo's success. Sega ran into financial trouble after the release of their Dreamcast console and had to shift to becoming a third-party developer, but their mark on gaming history with the Sega Genesis, Saturn, and Dreamcast must not be forgotten. 
especially their impact on gaming culture with their beloved mascot, Sonic the Hedgehog. Since Nintendo's meteoric rise as the savior of video games, it has been somewhat overshadowed by the gaming powerhouses that are Sony's PlayStation and Microsoft's Xbox. Now we find ourselves in the midst of the 8th generation of home video game consoles, with the PlayStation 4, Xbox One, Nintendo's Wii U, and of course, the ever-evolving PC gaming computers commonly referred to as the Master Race, for their unparalleled processing power and gaming capabilities in today's technological age. Video games have always left some kind of mark on the lives of those who play them, and with games becoming more and more immersive and realistic, that fact has become irrefutable. Many gamers will claim that playing video games has truly benefited them far beyond their entertainment value. In my life currently, where I see video games is really one as a release of like frustration or just a way to relax if I really need to. Another way is through social interaction. A lot of my friends play video games, even friends that don't like declare themselves as gamers, they also, they've played games and they're games that I can connect with them with. Like almost everybody I know has played a Mario Kart game and everyone I know wants to play Mario Kart at one point or another. And that's a way that I can bond and connect with them. A lot of the games that have been coming out recently, my favorite ones, they all tend to have really in-depth storylines that I can, as an adult, look at and say that wow, this is intense, this is powerful, like this completely changes my opinion on something. And I think that that's really great that there's still outlets that we are finding to completely revolutionize the way we might think. Super Mario Galaxy 2 is one of my favorite games. Uh, and the story, the plot of that game isn't very complex. Bowser's that kidnaps Peach again, and Mario goes out to get him. But even the act of being Mario and doing all those things, just living in that world, is uh, an experience like like no other. You know, I can nothing else has ever allowed me to jump among asteroids and get gold, super powerful golden stars, or you know, it's just uh, it allows uh, for interactivity. Really, is the key to video games and what they give beyond just like obviously the fun of in the moment playing the game, and that's what sticks with you the most. My interest in World of Warcraft was to look at the communication, how people communicated in that space. And at the time that I was writing, uh, I got a lot of pushback of people saying, why are you studying video games? There's nothing interesting going on there. There's nothing innovative or, and it's such a small group of people who play this that, that it's really not gonna be useful at all. But I really saw that there was complex negotiations, there were deep heartfelt friendships that were developed in those spaces, and that there was something about being able to have a shared experience across distances, no matter what your physical capabilities were at that point in your life, that managed to make a, a great impression on me. And so I talked about that. Uh, a lot of my dissertation was a chance to uh, tell people stories. They were finding ways to make the game fit exactly what they needed. And maybe it was an escape to get away from the stress of their everyday lives. Maybe uh, for one gentleman, he had uh, cancer and it was terminal. And they were trying they were trying multiple kinds of interventions, but it wasn't great, and he was sick, and he felt terrible, and he was, because he was in a lot of pain, he didn't sleep well. So when middle of the night, he would log in, and there was always somebody online, and there were always people he could chat with, um, and there was always something to do to distract himself. Uh, and I had some really meaningful conversations with him where he talked about the fact that he had to be strong for his family and he couldn't express to his family how scared he was and yet in the video game because there was that anonymity and because they weren't his family and they weren't right there with him he could say you know what I'm terrified I don't know what I'm going to do 
but you know, I'm here and I'm doing the things that I need to do. And by the way, let's go work on this quest because it gives me something to do and something to think about. I saw in stories like that, I saw the potential of communication in video games to really be a powerful space for communication. I contacted a number of gamers on the Reddit page for the video game Dark Souls to get their input on how the game has influenced their lives. This game in particular has a fiercely loyal fan base, and I wanted to ask people within its community why they love it so much and what playing it has done for them. When asked how the game had impacted him, Dark Souls player Chris Kim stated, I had lost a general enthusiasm in life. Nothing seemed entertaining. This led to a disinterest in people and ultimately a general lack of entertainment from games. That all changed with Dark Souls 2. Chris had spent three days stuck on one of the game's early bosses, the Pursuer, and the frustration of it almost overwhelmed him, but something in the back of his mind kept telling him, if you can't sit there and endure a video game like that, how will you face real world problems? It was that idea that kept Chris going, and when he finally felled his foe, the feeling of triumph made all the hardship worth it. My experience with the game has really changed me, says Chris. I feel less agitated when sitting down for long hours of study. My length of concentration has increased significantly, and when I face an obstacle in my work or studies, I remember the pursuer, and I look at my work and say, it's either you or me, and the way I see it, you're going down. Chris's story is very relatable for a lot of gamers. Sometimes the things we don't want to do pile up and become difficult obstacles to overcome, but through defeating seemingly impossible foes in video games after countless failures, we learn an important life lesson, that what seems impossible can be achieved. Once we apply the lessons we learn from games into our real lives, the tasks and duties thrust upon us are put into a new perspective, one that proves we can accomplish them if we put ourselves in the same mindset we have when we play a game. Another Redditor told me about his experience with Dark Souls and how it helped him through drug abuse. I was addicted to heroin since I was 16, he says, and when I got clean the only thing I hadn't sold was my PS3 and I bought a copy of Dark Souls 2 for something to do when I was getting over the sickness, and now I've been clean for eight months. No alcohol or pills or weed or anything. I'm working at an animal shelter, living in a sober house, and have no desire to ever use again, and I play Dark Souls 2 every day. I seriously think it's helped me find something safe and positive I enjoy doing when I'm bored. Though a video game certainly can't cure drug addiction, it is very clear that the emotional experience of playing a game has a lot of healing power in the way it can offer a distraction from harmful activities and play a large role in the recovery process through providing an outlet that promotes personal progression and the accomplishment of difficult tasks. The emergence of games in popular culture has caused vast communities to rise up in the form of online blogs, forums, YouTube channels, and more. There are thousands of pages on reddit.com dedicated to discussions about particular video games where a constant flow of stories and ideas are being shared every minute of the day, showing just how far beyond playing the game most gamers go in order to commune with other fans and engage in largely intellectual discussions and debates. But of course this is the internet, and with the shield of anonymity comes scores of negative comments and even cyberbullying. This is one of the biggest problems that gaming communities face, and it gives a bad name to gamer culture. There's a strong culture of exclusion that happens around video games. A sense of, if you are a real gamer, you will fit this criteria, you will act this way, you will speak this way. There's pleasure that goes into being part of the in-crowd, and there's been some very severe response against people who don't fit those criteria, who don't speak the way that they should, who don't behave in exactly the way that they, they behave. Games like League of Legends and Call of Duty, widely known for their multiplayer aspects, tend to have their names tarnished by incredibly offensive smack talk between players, usually referring to each other's mothers in physically impossible sexual acts. 
This is all well and good between friends, but it tends to build up animosity between players that can escalate into serious and dangerous problems. Things like swatting, where during live streams, a viewer will use illicit software to call 911, a SWAT team is then dispatched to the streamer's home to forcibly detain them live and on camera. All this just to impede someone's game progress, or even just for a few sick laughs. It's things like this that get news coverage and make people associate these criminal actions with video games. But it's important to be able to realize that these are individuals, not the entire community, and their actions, while immoral, should not speak for the games themselves. Though gaming culture is no stranger to negativity, it's important to look at the positive aspects, as they largely go unnoticed in light of gaming's negative press. There are many charity organizations centered around gaming that seek to use the influence of video games for good. Organizations and events like Awesome Games Done Quick, Extra Life, Gamers Outreach, Able Gamers, and Child's Play are just a few of the ways video games have an impact on funding medical research, veteran outreach, helping children with disabilities, and fighting world hunger. These gaming marathons and tournaments are all conducted under a common goal of helping others and promoting positive change. In the last 10 years, these charities have raised upwards of $100 million for these causes, truly proving that gamers have played a role in improving the lives of others all across the world. So, when the Wii first came out, people were very excited about the potential for getting people to engage in interactions with the Wii. I need to exercise more, so I'm going to exercise in front of the Wii. It'll make me move, rather than just sitting on my couch. Uh, that's been to some success, although Wiis were purchased by a lot of elderly care places. Other than the Wii, in some more interesting ways, gaming technology has been clearly demonstrated to help with physical therapy. Anytime you need to do a repetitive motion, or you need to stretch a muscle, or practice strengthening something where if you just sat down and did the exercise over and over again, it's, it's difficult to want to do it, it's difficult to do it the same, and you get bored, and it's easy to stop doing it. But if you sit down and say, okay, tell someone, all right, you have to play this game where you're popping balloons, then you know, you're focusing on the actions in the game and not realizing that you're actually doing the repetitive motions with your, with your hands or, or things like that. So there's been some really interesting research on how the game aspect shifts people's mental focus so that, that they can do stuff that they need to do. There's also a really interesting line of research that's been done about PTSD. USC has done some research looking at part of the problem with returning soldiers who have PTSD is that anything that triggers a memory or something like that can, can cause uh, detrimental effects. And so there's been some great research where they've looked at creating simulations and putting soldiers in these simulations that are somewhat safe spaces and slowly acclimating them to you are safe even though you're getting some of these triggers. On, on a, even a lighter level, there's been some a few studies that have looked at how soldiers play first-person shooter games as kind of a, almost a self-medication as a way to, okay, I'm coming back from being in a high-stress space where people literally are shooting at me and I'm able to say, okay, I'm in that space in the video game and I'm playing these games where I'm in that kind of tension um, and now I'm turning the game off and I'm remembering that I'm not in that zone anymore and then I'm back in a, in a space where I don't have to have that same level of tension. So in terms of simulation, there's an, and kind of accessing people um, and helping people to, to work through things. I think there's been a lot of really interesting work there. So let's think, why is it good to game? We've learned that games in past times have been vital to civilized life throughout history, 
and that video games stem from that ancient human desire for amusement and leisure. We realize that even though there are members of gaming communities that give their culture a bad name, they needn't overshadow the immense good that these communities achieve through charity work. We heard personal accounts from players about how playing games has directly influenced their lives in positive ways, and we discovered the implications gaming has for the advancement of medical science. With all this before us, we can see why video games have become as popular and widespread as they are, and we can look forward to a bright future where they can only continue to enthrall us. If you're not a gamer, think of the ways you spend your free time and realize that they may have many parallels with why those who are enjoy video games so much. And if you are a gamer, keep playing, keep exploring, and always appreciate what someone else's talents have allowed you to experience. And never forget why it's good to game.